Real estate is about freedom, choice freedom, time freedom, and money freedom, and the impact you can make with that freedom. But it doesn't come without cost. Your freedom takes work. That's why Neil Timmons brings together the tools you need to build your real estate legacy, from tips and tricks to interviews with industry titans. It's all here in one place. Real grit. Let's get to it. What if I told you you can make 20 times the return of a single family fix and flip on your next big deal? Well, it's actually possible. It's possible inside the world of commercial real estate. Say, I'm inviting you to this free challenge. It starts August 15th. It's totally free. It's a five-day challenge where I'm going to take you and deep dive into the world of commercial real estate, more specifically, capital multiplier properties, what that is, how we identify them. I'm going to show you how to identify them, how to evaluate them, and how to lock them up risk-free. I'm going to give you all the paperwork to do it. It's totally free. You can sign up to join us at www.20xprofitchallenge.com forward slash real grit. That's www.20xprofitchallenge.com forward slash real grit. And I'll see you in the challenge. Got a good one for you today. David Olds is coming up. He's got an incredible story about how he lived through the crisis right in the, right in the middle of it down in Florida and how he was able to make a decision ultimately to pick up his family, everybody, and move to a totally different environment, place he'd never been to essentially before he made that decision to go live and invest in a totally different location and what it's been like for the last 10 years. So it's an incredible story of an entrepreneur's journey. Stay tuned. David Olds coming right up. I got David Olds with me here. I'm excited to have him here. David, how are you, my friend? How are you, buddy? Good, man. It's good to see you. Yeah. We just saw each other a couple of days ago. A couple of days ago in the flesh. Yes. I know, first time. Yeah, it, it has been. talking a bunch. Yes, we've, we've connected. I was on Instagram live with you. You were my first. I'll never forget you. <laughs> <laughs> was it really? That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah that was, I, I, that was I've great. been following you for a long time and um, see you on all the podcasts and was interacting with you a little bit on Al's podcast. So, yeah, I, I saw you at one mastermind, but we got thrown out because of a hurricane. So we didn't yeah. get a chance to connect there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. The other day was the, was the first time. Yeah. No, well, it was good. To, it's good to connect up. And I'm glad we uh, thanks for making some time for us to have a conversation sure. here on, no, the, on, on here. the podcast. See, let's start here. Everybody starts someplace. They, they all get into this industry one way or another somehow. Yeah. How'd you get how'd you get into this biz? So for me, I grew up and my dad was a um just hardworking ex-military guy and like always wanted to remodel houses that we lived in and build additions and do all of that stuff. So I was, you know, literally that that uh you know kid at you know 15 who's having to do all the things with his uh his parents, and I just absolutely hated life as as much as um I possibly could because. I had to do, I had to do stuff, right? I was a kid. I wanted to be out playing. Right. Um, and it's, it's interesting when you're, when you're a kid and having to rake the grass and take shingles up to the roof and, you know, but go trips to Home Depot and all those types of things. Um, you know, you say, I'm never going to do this stuff to my kids when I get older. Yeah. And inevitably what happens, we all turn into, into our parents, which is, which is kind of crazy. Um, so yeah, so I grew up around like remodeling and stuff, not like on a professional level, but just, my parents doing it. And, uh, you know, I went to college, you know, worked my way through college in a retail store, just, you know, trying to, trying to pay for it. Um, and then I, I moved to Florida in 1993 and ended up working for this big hardware store, the big chain in Florida and found myself like right back in it. But on the other side, helping mm -hmm. people like me who would have to stumble in the door and be like, uh, I need a stainless steel screw. I'd look at the paper, you know, number 10 by one and a half, like no idea what, what they were asking for. Right. So I certainly had a lot of empathy for that and dealing with, with contractors and remodelers now on, on the selling side, um, you know, which felt kind of natural for me. And then, you know, when my wife and I bought our first house, we decided, well, let's, let's remodel it. And there I was, I was all of a sudden my, my parents. Yeah. <laughs> so sort of backed into it that way, kind of a weird thing. No, that's crazy. Did you stay there in Florida or, or maybe the better question is how long were you in Florida? Then? Yeah, I was in Florida for, um, let's see, from 93 until 2009. So what happened what is lot. my wife and I, we bought our first house. And, you know, this is again, 2000, 
2002, yes, 2002, had no idea what a foreclosure was. Like, even though, like, I, I kind of in the back of my head thought about, you know, buying properties and fixing them up. Because um, in those days, the only show that we had, Neil, was like this old house. Correct. Like, that was it. It was yeah. HGTV, none of that, none right. of that existed. Um, so, like, I kind of thought, like, oh, that'd be fun to, like, fix up a house. Um, so, anyways, we we bought this house. It was a foreclosure from Wells Fargo. We had no idea that even went until, like, literally we were walking into the closing or walking out, you know, that that it was a foreclosure. It was just a vacant house. I don't know. Like, yeah. what, is, what do you know? So, um, so, we bought that. And because, you know, I was working in that, you know, builder supply kind of kind of environment. And I had a little background. I'm like, well, we can fix this up, right? We could tear out this pink carpet and put in some laminate floors. We can uh, put some crown molding up. We can take out a sliding glass door and put in French doors. We could pour up concrete patio. Like we could do stuff, right? Because yeah. I was younger and skinnier and had a lot more energy back then. And uh, so anyway, so two years later, we wanted to move a little closer to where I was working and we sold the house which was fine. Right. That's a normal thing. But my realtor, as we were walking in, she said, uh, you know, you don't have to pay taxes on this money. I'm like, well, I don't understand. I pay taxes every day. Right. Right. Like, what is, what is that? And she said, oh, well, because you've lived in it for two years, it's homesteaded, you know, it's just tax-free money. And I was like, like, I remember just stopping on the sidewalk, walking to the car. I'm like, what? Yeah. How? That's amazing. Why does nobody tell you this? And she's like, well, everybody knows, dummy. I'm like, oh, okay. So I thought, well, self, let's do this again. Like, <laughs> Let's go buy another yeah. house and, and fix it up again. And it was when we were working on that next property that I found the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm. It's a pretty easy read if anybody hasn't read it. Um, and, you know, in that, you know, Kiyosaki talks about, you know, investing as a, you know, as a way to build wealth. So, you know, I always tell people I'm not that smart, but I'm very good at following directions. And at the end of the book, he says, you know, you know, he talks about all, all types of different strategies. But if you want to be in real estate, you should go find a real estate group like a meetup or RIA, which is a real estate investment association. So I did that, right? I went to, you know, it's 2002 to, or 2000, maybe four now. And I go to my big computer with the big monitor, you know, those yep. ones that we used to have. And I'm, you know, type in like real estate, Orlando. And uh, I found a, a real estate group there and I went there. Um, you know, it was, I was very nervous because there was all these people, it was like 300 people back in the heyday of RIAs. And, uh, you know, I, I went in and started to learn. I just applied myself and went to the boot camps and bought the courses and just did all the things and got really immersed. And that's, that's sort of how the foundation was laid for us. Wow. All right. So you, you, you kind of stumbled into it as I, as I said, we all, in, we all get in yeah. one way or another. So you stumbled well, into think, it. And, yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, there was a kernel of an idea for sure. Um, and that's, you know, how these things normally happen for people, um, whether you're starting a business or, yeah. you know, you want to do something, there's always this little idea and that was like, as I was driving by a house, maybe someplace but like, oh, that could be fixed up because, right. you know, I did it as a kid growing up and drywall and all those types of things. So, you know, and then I'm working in a retail store and I'm working with contractors and I'm out visiting job sites. I'm like, well, you're not that smart. And then, you know, then to the RIA. So, um, but then my mind was opened up to buying subject to buying with owner financing, buying with hard money, buying with all these other things that, you know, the general public never sees, you know, I like to say it's sort of like the, the curtain at the Wizard of Oz, right? All of a sudden somebody pulls back the curtain and you're like, oh my goodness, all these cool strategies, you know, it's like magic the first time you see it. I, 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 I make that, uh, the comparison to the matrix, red pill, yeah. blue pill. And once you take it, you can't go back. Right. Right. Once you, you know, once you open up that curtain, you now, now, you know. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's interesting that you say that because that's, you know, that's something that we see as entrepreneurs. If we lost everything today, you and me, yeah. boom, it's like literally the accounts are drained. They lock the doors to our office. I'd be like, well, I got a car, a pad of paper and a pen. I can start again tomorrow because you just, you can't take that knowledge away from you once it's, mm, once it's in your no. head. Career, yeah. The knowledge and that internal fire, that hustle, right? That, that that ability to go out and make it happen no matter what the odds, how the odds are stacked against you. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes we we put up those imaginary walls. They're not really stacked against you. It's just this is just what it is. And there's so much opportunity out there. And you experienced that coming through the late two yeah. thousands. Talk to me about that. The late two thousands. Yeah. Well, it was terrible. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was bad to be in the middle of it. When you look back, you realize how horrible it, it, it actually was. was yeah. um, so, so my wife and I, we, we both had regular jobs, even though we were investing. Um, I was working for a company called Cox Lumber in COX in, uh, in Florida, very similar to Builders First Source or Pro Build or 84 Lumber, that type of thing. Right. Mm-hmm. So I was a manager and I actually ran um, a, the largest millwork production facility in Central Florida. So we made doors and molding and, you know, stuff yeah. like that. So anyways, um, you know, I was spending a lot of time at the RIA, lots of time. Like I would go home at night and I'm studying, I'm, you know, again, back then, none of this information was out there. No right. podcasts, no YouTube, no, you know, none of those things existed. So usually like once a week, there was a webinar. Somebody would, you know, Tim Mai or Preston Neely, somebody would have a webinar yep. and you knew they were going to sell you something at the end, yeah. but it was okay because this was really your only source of information. There just wasn't a lot out there. Yep. You could go pick up a Robert Allen book or something like that. But, um, you know, short of going to Ria's, this was very limited information. So anyways, um, you know, we're working full-time jobs. I was, you know, doing, doing sales and mill work and, and that type of stuff. My wife was a purchasing manager, assistant purchasing manager for a large custom home builder. So we had great jobs, which was fine. Uh, it was really good. That's better than fine. But on the side, we were, we were remodeling these houses, you know, nights and weekends, that type of stuff. So, so we had done that over and over and over again. And the difference back then, because it's very different from what happened you know, a few months ago and what we're not in, it's not a recession, anything like what that was. That was a true crash. Yep. What I tell people and, and, you know, you were around back then is you kind of felt like there was a little adjustment happening, a little bit of a slide. You know, you could you could feel like, hey, this is selling for a little bit less than it was before. But it wasn't like alarm bells were going off yet. Sure. Right. It was just like, oh, this is just things are slowing down. It just felt OK. It felt normal, like no big deal. Like and, and until it <laughs> until it wasn't normal anymore. Right. And what happened for us. So in the business that I was in building materials, I was selling to large track track builders, builders, yeah. Pulte, Pulte Homes, um, you know, Centec, like the people who build 10,000 units a year. Yep. And we started to feel you know, when you're selling to those people, you're on a contract, right? Model, the Elm tree model left gets exactly this. This is the price. It's, it's all pre-negotiated. Well, we were noticing that they were changing the standards and the standards would be, let's say you had a five and a quarter inch baseboard, like big baseboard, you know, cause it's, it's a nicer type property. Right. Maybe you had solid doors, right. Or smooth two panel, whatever. What we were noticing is slowly they were lowering the standards, but of course, trying to keep the price up as best they could because yes. sales were slowing. So, so they were trying to generate, generate more profit. Um, so again, not the end of the world, right? In an, in and of itself, that in a vacuum, it's, it's not terrible, right. but you know, so slowly those things were happening. Sales were slowing down just a little bit. Um, my wife had lost her job, like they had downsized. So that wasn't great. And we knew we knew we wanted to invest more. We knew that Orlando by this, you know, by 2008, we're like, okay, something's slowing down. Mm-hmm. We really couldn't afford to buy in Orlando because it was very expensive. We wanted to buy multifamilies, right? We sure. wanted to do some commercial yep. stuff. So I remember I went up to Boston and went to this event from a guy named Dave Lindahl, who's probably the smartest emerging markets guy that I've ever met. And yeah. it was a, it was an event on buying apartment complexes and emerging markets. And uh, I remember on the last day of the event, you know, you're standing in this auditorium with hundreds of people yeah. had this huge like movie screen up on the wall. And this dude literally there with like a, a red laser pointer going city by city throughout the whole country talking about what's going on in those markets, whether they're up or down. Yeah. And one of the things that they really talk about is just because your market may be down, it doesn't mean the whole country is down. Right. Yep. And by, you know, early 2008, Thing, bad things were starting to happen, right? Like at this point now, things are sliding faster yes. downhill. And uh, it's very interesting to see that like in Texas, even though Florida was dying quickly on the vine, Texas was in a surge, right? Because they their economy is different. They are based on oil and things. So anyways, so we knew we wanted to go someplace. And I remember being there and he was pointing to Chattanooga, this weird little small town of 160,000 people. And he said, hey, this is a interesting little market. It's been very flat. It's been very stable. And, you know, typically, I know I'm bouncing all over the place here, but 
typically the markets that drop very quickly are the ones that rose very sharp, right? Correct. Up, Extremes. Down. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's like vacation areas, coastal areas, you know, it's just certain like Austin, you know, that's one of those areas that's just getting pummeled right now right. because it has 400% appreciation. And then now it's, it's dropping a little bit. So anyways, Chattanooga, very stable market. Um, Volkswagen was going to open their first production facility in the United States here. That's mm. a big deal. Mm-hmm. Amazon was opening two fulfillment centers here, you know, warehouses. And then in looking at the economy, it was very diverse, right? So the problem in Florida was this. In Florida, the economy is based on three things, right? Construction, because construction is huge there because so many people are, are moving to Florida. Tourism, right? Disney, mm-hmm. Universal, SeaWorld, all those things. And agriculture, oranges and livestock, cattle, right? It's very big there. So when the recession did finally hit, well, what died? It was like a three-legged stool. Construction stopped, right? It was stopping. Tourism stopped because we were in a nationwide recession. There were some good areas, but mostly it was bad and it was bad news. So people stopped. So literally that's why Florida collapsed so quickly. So when looking at Chattanooga, that was something we were very aware of. I was aware of. I'm like, I don't want to go a place where if any one sector of the economy crashes, we're done. So Chattanooga, um, Little Debbie, the little snack cakes, yeah. big facilities here, like where just factory after factory is here. Brock and Brock, Lifesavers, Moon Pies, Unum, which is an international uh, insurance company is based here, thousands of employees. Blue Cross is headquartered for the Southeast here. North Georgia has textile mills, tons and tons of textile mills. So, um, so it's a very diverse economy where, you know, if any one sector did fall for some reason, the whole place wouldn't just, just die. Also, Chattanooga was the first city in the country to have uh, gigabyte internet access for every house in the, the county, which wow. was a big thing. Yep. That's why there's a lot of Google stuff here. Gary V, one of his marketing companies is here. So anyways, all that being said, it, it seemed like a very safe place to come, come and invest. And uh, so we had the plan. We had the plan that we were going to come here. And like every everybody, we wanted to go one more round on the houses in Florida. Yeah. And it's always that last round that kind of gets you, you know, yeah. you're like, I'm going to, I'm going to just take one more, one more swing at the, uh, at the pinata here. So I bought this house in, uh, middle of 2008. And just before we, we bought this house, like, like the numbers were kind of stable ish, like you were on the downward slide, but you know, it was still okay. So we bought this house. It was a probate deal for ninety-seven thousand, and literally, you know, is in Deltona, Florida, seven forty-two Trafalgar Street. If everybody wants to look it up, so one block over, two blocks down, an identical house had just sold for two fourteen. So, like, this seems like a good bet, right? Again, in hindsight, we realize it was terrible, but in the moment, it seemed okay. So, so uh, I bought this house. We uh, we started working on it. We actually moved into this one because we had sold everything else. And uh, fixed it up. And did, I finished somewhere in October, early November. I called my realtor and she said, yeah, you know, let's not put it on the market right now because it's the holidays. You don't want to build up a bunch of days on market and then not sell. Let's just wait till January. I'm like, well, that makes perfect sense. Probably the worst advice I've ever gotten on a real estate deal. Yeah. Because what happened between July and January was absolutely horrific in Florida. What we had been doing in the RIAs for like the last five years is they were talking about go out and find pre-foreclosures and make offers and subject to and owner financing and all these things because, you know, people are having houses foreclosed. Right. But nobody made the connection that at some point, all of these houses are going to be back in the bank's possession and they're going to be done with it. Mm-hmm. Guess what happened in late 2008? They just opened the books Blood. Yeah. and they started flooding the market absolutely flooding it with all of this bad debt that they had that they needed to turn back into you know into good debt because you know bad debt it's toxic debt for the banks so miss shana comes over in january and she says you know you did a great job and i'm like yeah thank you i know it looks good i'm like i know i said what do you think we can sell this for and this is again 2009 pre pre pre-internet and ipad so big notebook starts flipping pages well this one sold for that this one sold for that she's like you know, maybe 145. And I'm like, what do you mean 145? It was one block over, two blocks down, 214. 
And she's like, yeah, but that was then. This is now. I'm like, then was six months ago. <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about? That's how quickly the market dropped in Florida. Wow. When it finally hit the wall, boom, it dropped. And, you know, of course, being an arrogant young nitwit that I was, I'm like, well, my house is better, Neil. Mine's better. Right. I'm remodeled. Right. That house isn't remodeled. The bank took it back and it's still got junk in it. And it just didn't matter, right? right? Because nobody was buying, nobody could get credit. I mean, it was just, it was the just, supply and demand factors are so far it, out of whack. It didn't it matter was, at all. Uh, show up the first order. Yeah. So, but I didn't realize it. And again, I'm so I said, well, let's do this. Let's put it out at 155. And I thought I was the most magnanimous SOB that's ever walked the face of the earth, right? I'm like, mine will sell because mine's better. And she's like, mm, okay, she's a listing agent, right? So they don't care. They just want the sign in the yard. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it turns out she was 100% right and I should have listened to her. But uh, so this now we're in January and, you know, we had been going back and forth to Chattanooga. I was working, my brother was working with us, my wife. So we were marketing up here. We were doing some stuff. My brother was spending time up here. We were trying to get it going because we knew we knew we were going to relocate. And uh, anyways, for a month in January, like not even a call, dude. Not like, like I'm 60 grand below what the last house sold for when I bought yeah. it. Like 25%, not a peep. So I'm patient though, right? Like I'm I'm working, I'm, you know, I'm a good client. I'm not a person who's up your butt all the time. So February comes around, I'm like, hey, like, what do you, what can we do? I'm like, God, I'm looking to her to do some magic, realtor magic. Right. It's like, oh, you dropped the price. I'm like, oh God. Because like this move, this, this, when we sell this rehab, this is going to be all the money that we've got. Um, you know, because even though we've done other deals, right, we're paying bills, we're going on vacations, you know, we're doing dumb stuff, right? Yep. yep. Oh, so I'm like, all right, let's drop to 145. And she's like, okay. I said, do you think that's going to do it? She's like, no, there's been all these lower sales. I don't know. I'm like, no, 145, we'll get it. Let's, let's just do this and done and pull the bandaid yep. off. So 145, we we list it for like, you know, 30, another 30 days. We got a couple calls, but not even a showing. And now I'm like, oh my God, mm. like what, what, like the earth is just upside down, right? right? It's not anything that we know and understand. And, you know, what we went through six months ago does not even compare to what was happening. And uh, so another 30 days go by, I'm like, like, we got to do something. Because by now I've told my job that I'm leaving in yeah. June. Yeah. Right. I gave him some notice and uh, I'm like, all right, 140, you know, or 139 or 138 or some, something like that. We got a couple showings, but still no offers. So now, you know, now we're getting to April. I'm like April, May, June, like I'm out in June. Like now I'm getting into a little bit of panic. And I said, well, all right, David, what, like we got to do something. We got to solve a problem here. So I canceled my listing. I went and got a bunch of blank bandit signs and I wrote up bandit signs like, a hundred of them that said owner will finance 5,000 down lease purchase, you know, you know, whatever, yep. because again, you know, I've been to a lot of RIAs and had a lot of education and paid for a lot of stuff. So that was what worked. And what happened was it, I mean, it still took about two months to find somebody with $5,000. Um, so I found this nurse who was willing to put up the $5,000 and literally like, on june 6th i think it was like she was moving in we were moving out i got a check for five thousand dollars that's all that i had to my name like that was it we packed up a u-haul it's me my wife our two boys and and uh and three three fat dogs and uh hmm. and my brother and we, we backed it up packed up the u-haul left super early drove to chattanooga and i had you know one of the times when i was up a couple months before we had contracted this house to buy sub two. And I'm like, well, I guess we could move in there, right? Because we have to go someplace. Someplace, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's 577 miles, by the way, from Orlando to Chattanooga. It's a long ride. Yep. Kids, dogs, driving a 24-foot U-Haul, the whole thing. And go to the closing, or like the last closing of the day. It was sub two. So we bought the house with literally just closing costs, yep. which is awesome, which is cool. Absolutely. Um, just sold that house a couple of weeks ago for like, I don't know, our net on it was 90 grand. Um, but anyway, so so we drive over to the house. I back this U-Haul into the house. The neighborhood's not as good as I remembered it <laughs> when I was there a couple months ago. Yeah. Kind of kind of in a rough part of town. 
And, uh, you know, you're, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but you're just, you're, you know, as tired as tired can be, mm. like your emotions are just off the charts. You know, the whole way up, I'm thinking, geez, you know, I didn't get what I wanted for that house. It wasn't my plan. It, you know, just, it's a lot. So we get to the house and, uh, Again, everything is bad, right? You know, when I walked it before, it just, I don't know, maybe I wasn't paying attention, but like, you know, the floors were kind of jacked up. It's like yeah. a 1900s old house in Chattanooga. Yeah. There's no central air, old windows, half the electric didn't work in the house. Like now it's like eight o'clock at night. We're just, it's everything we could do to just open the truck and drag two blankets in there and, yeah. and a couple of mattresses and throw a fan on us just to get to sleep in june in chattanooga it's terrible and that was probably one of the worst nights of my life like i, I tell people a lot you know i laid there thinking what the hell did i do mm. like we did have a beautiful house in orlando or you know deltona we had just remodeled it you know why why would i leave there to come to chattanooga and i've drugged my wife and family up here and you know you know the, the pressure right you're going to be a good dad and a That's husband right. and all those yep. things and and I'm laying there on this mattress, and I know people have had like worse days than this, right? But like, I, it was terrible. Like, <laughs> I felt so bad. I literally just cried to sleep that night. It was, it was. I'm like, I just made the worst mistake ever, and I'm an idiot. And you know, but anyways. So you moved to Chattanooga. Yeah. You're there. You're experiencing a range of emotions. It is yeah. a, it is a, a a lull for for where you're yeah. at. Yep. But things things don't uh, things don't always stay that way. They don't. And, you know, one thing about entrepreneurs we, we talked about a little earlier is we do have that grit and that fire and that, OK, we're going to figure this out. Right. And I I tell people, like, you know, it's OK to have a bad afternoon. We don't have two bad days in a row, though. Right. Right. Get, get up. Put your big boy pants on. Let's go figure this out. So, you know, we knew we were going to wholesale. We knew we were going to do something. And here we are. You know, I tell people we were broke, divided by two. <laughs> you know, that's that's the money we had. It was yeah. nothing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had $5,000 and, you know, we spent some of that on the U-Haul and getting up here and a thousand something to, for the closing. So there wasn't a lot, but I had enough to go get some bandit signs. So again, you know, bandit signs, markers, stands, we buy houses, like hundreds of them. We, we, we made as many as we possibly could. And we started putting them out, you know, every Friday night, any other night that we could, but every Friday we put out at least a hundred. And during the day, you know, we did real estate. Like that was what I did. And, you know, people ask a lot, well, what does it take to be successful? Focus. Focus is what it takes, right? Like, you know, doing this and being an entrepreneur and starting something new. And we didn't have mentors. I didn't have coaches. Like we were on the let's figure it out ourselves plan. Um, you know, it's lifting a big stone. You know, you're it's a big lift to get to get something like this off the ground. But it was the first thing I thought about in the morning. It was the thing I did all day. And it was the last thing I thought about at night. And luckily, my wife was on board for these shenanigans. Mm -hmm. um, but during the day, we're driving for dollars. We're, you know, have trying to have lunch with local investors, just trying to do anything that we can to, to figure this out. And we got our first deal. It was within a couple of weeks, weirdly enough, because I hate lease options. But it was it, we found these people that had a house and they wanted to lease option it. So we got like $2,500 is the option fee. And we connected them and, and made the deal happen. Um, that was our first deal. And then pretty quickly, we got a couple more just straight wholesale deals. And then from there, we just, we just had traction. And, you know, the interesting thing about Chattanooga is nobody was wholesaling when we came here. Like nobody, no, like, they didn't even know what it was. Power Pactor would do two or three a year, but like the, the city, the investor community was a bunch of landlords. They didn't, they didn't know about wholesaling mm -hmm. and we rolled in and just really were able to. We just worked hard. We just outworked everybody that there was, and we just dominated the space. Fast forward me a few years. You're still in Chattanooga. What does what does life look like? What does business look like for you? Yeah. So you know, s slow growth. Um, you know, I was a very anti big team guy for a long time. Very anti virtual wholesaling. So we, you know, we just carried on here in Chattanooga. Started buying rental properties. We got very good at learning, you know, owner financing. Um, you know, where the seller carries the note on a free and clear property subject to that type of stuff. We accumulated, we were up over a hundred rentals at one point. Um, market started to change 2014, 15. We shifted into rehabbing, did a ton of rehabs, made so much money. 
made the mistake of not putting money aside, <laughs> you know, for taxes, those pesky things. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm still paying tax bills uh, monthly from back in 2016 and 15, 16 and 17. Um, but uh, yeah, we, you know, we, we continued to grow, brought on a couple of partners and, you know, with partners, you can only split the pie so many ways. So that was what got us into, you know, the virtual wholesaling model. Yep. Again, before anybody really was really teaching it like they are now. And we we found every way to mess that up too. <laughs> you know, we went to places like Birmingham and St. Louis and, you know, places where houses were cheap. And, uh, you know, we realized, again, it's a supply and demand. There's so much supply of junk houses. And yeah, I regularly say sometimes free is too expensive. Oh my goodness! Do we um, just because it's cheap doesn't mean squat. Yeah, and you know we applied like what we knew here, and thinking that that same formula would apply someplace else, right? Mm -hmm. Like here, we got really great at contracting properties under twenty five thousand, like really good. Um, in nine, ten, eleven, twelve, before the market started to turn, because nobody was rehabbing, right? Right? You didn't wholesale a property to a rehabber because there were very very few of them because the market hadn't turned around yet. Correct. So, you know, our primary buyer was a landlord. So we we really stayed in the, de you know, kind of the depressed lower end areas. And we were contracting for 8, 10, 12, selling, you know, our average assignment was four or five grand, which back then was good. Yeah. We were doing a lot of them, you know. It's incredible. And today you do virtual wholesale today and then uh, you connect with other folks. Um, yeah. Help who who have who have some needs. You know, a lot of people will connect and and yeah, you know, especially right now as the market's turned a bit. You know, the buyers look a little different than when they once did. So people connect and uh, contract the deal, but they can't move the deal on the backside. Yeah. Well, I think what happened is you know people come in and out of our space very quickly. Yes. It's pretty rare to find people that have been through multiple cycles. It really is you very know, true. We were yes. in a room of a couple hundred people and. I think I asked for who, when I was on stage, who had been through a couple market cycles and there might've been five hands. Like yep. it's pretty rare. So, you know, perception is reality. So those people that only started in maybe 20, where are we at? Yeah, 2019, they only knew, right? What a bull market. They only knew, you know, literally I can contract almost anything. <laughs> I've only, you know, I have so much room for error because we're in an appreciating market. And you know, some buyer will buy it or some hedge fund will buy it. Mm -hmm. And that's great. Like, I'm not the person that downgrade or degrades those. Like, do you start it at the top of the market? Um, but it won't always be this way. You know, and that's something I would I would preach. Um, I did not have any idea that it would stop as quickly as it did. Yep. But so those people weren't prepared for um for the dumb money to leave the market, right? And when I say dumb money, you know, some of the hedge funds that were just looking for a quick and easy buck. And there are lots of different types of hedge funds. People try to always group them together. But the doctors, the lawyers, the dentists, the, you know, guys who were sitting on cash buying a $200,000 house to quick paint it, carpet it, and flip it for 260, right? Yep. Because the market was shooting up. Like those people all left the market and you were back to the serious buyers and roles changed, right? There were a lot of arrogant wholesalers about a year ago. You'll buy my stuff. If you don't like it, I'll sell it to somebody else. And I would tell them, like, dude, someday the market's going to change and the buyers are going to be in control. And when that shift happened, the buyers were in control. Mm -hmm. And they knew, hey, you know, there's not as many buyers anymore. And if I'm going to spend my money, I'm going to get the best deal possible. That's right. Right. So, but for us, like, that's where we started. Right. It's what is that Batman, uh, the movie with Bane, right? I was born in the dark. Yeah. We were born in this. Like, this is just a, this is cool for us. Right. right. Like, the, the way that we did, um, that we sold our deals, like, we've always done it the same way. We were never dependent on those types of people. We were always really good at marketing. We were great at talking to buyers and figuring out what they needed and how we served them. And so, so that wasn't a big transition for us. Um, style wise, right now there was definitely less buyers and things slowed down even even for us. But um, not that big of, a, of an adjustment. Yeah, let's do this. I want to move on to the final segment, what I call four for impact. Your yeah. favorite quote? What's your favorite quote? Um, what is it? It's I want to see if I, if I can get it right. It's uh, Jim Rome. Is it Jim Rome? I think he was maybe the first. Everybody says it now, but I think he yeah. might have been the first one that says you're the average of the five people yes. uh, that you spend the most time with. And the reason I think that's important in our industry is 
you know, it's hard, right? Like anybody that gets on Instagram or TikTok and, you know, it's so easy to go out and make $50,000, you know, to do that repetitively, like it's, it's challenging. You have to have a lot of things lined up. And sometimes being an entrepreneur can be a little bit lonely, right? If you work out of your house and you're sitting at your kitchen table, like there are going to be good days, there are going to be bad days. Yep. And, you know, I do really believe in that idea of having, you know, surrounding yourself with other people who are successful, you know, having that tribe of people that can, can help you on the days when, when you're having a tough day, because we all have tough days. I don't care the most famous person, you know, influencer or whatever on Instagram is going to have a bad day. Um, and you need people that you can call, whether they're local or across the country. I'm lucky enough to have a lot of great friends like you across the country where I can, I can call and go, hey, man, what do, you, what do you think about this, man? Just a quick question, right? And, you know, we're all there for each other where, you know, somebody can call me and go, you know, just, you know, while we were at that event, I had, to, I had a long talk with somebody who was struggling in their business and, you know, hey, here's my here's what I would do. Here's here's how I would get through that. So so anyways, having those people, you know, really help you succeed and move faster. And I've tried the the go it alone lone wolf thing um, because I thought I didn't need anybody's help. And that was terrible thinking. It was I, I would be so much further ahead today if I had had that mentality, you know, in 2009, um, you know, and got out of Chattanooga a little bit and you know went to experience it. Do you regularly assess who's in your top five? Yes, I've actually got a top 100 list that I keep on my phone. Oh, really? Um, yeah. People that I'm looking to make connections with. And since I've done that, I've made a lot of those connections, which is interesting because now I'm very intentional about it. And it's not that like somebody's all of a sudden not in the top five. I'm just always trying to like network and connect with people, people like you, people, you know, because you're great at commercial stuff, which I'm not. So that's something that I'm fascinated with and I want to learn and figure out how I can bring value to you and, to, you know, to to your team and to, you know, the people that you're around. Um, but yeah, no, I, I definitely am always looking at um, trying to be better, right? Um, because that's, I think that's again, an op- where we started, right? That's an entrepreneurial thing. We climb mountains and we get to the top and then we're like, well, I have to find a new mountain to climb. Yeah, that's exactly. Like, what's the next thing I'm going to do? Right. What do you think holds most investors back from hitting their personal next level? Well, fear, 100% fear. Fear know? what? Well, fear of a lot of things, fear of yeah. success. I'll tell you, you know, we're planning some really big stuff um, in our companies. And there are days where you're just like, you know, you, and it, for, for me, I have to really dig to get to what the fear is, but it's fear of success. Like, mm. oh my God, what if this works? <laughs> what, if, what if this crazy idea works? Can we do it? Like, can, you know, I don't, maybe fear of looking dumb, you know, trying something and failing. Yeah. But the reality is you're going to fail a lot. For sure. Like, what did um, Einstein said? I never failed. I just learned a thousand ways to make a, to make a light bulb. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah fear of failure, I think. And, you know, because of that, um, we put, we put, uh, we build some things up to be things that they're not. Like I remember the first time I went to get a car loan and then a house loan and then a, then a rehab loan. I'm like, Oh, nobody's ever going to approve me. I was freaking shocked when I got approved for a loan yeah. because I just thought, you know, again, that's that self doubt and right. you know, I'm loaded up with Catholic guilt too. So like nobody's ever going to approve yeah. me. I'm not good enough. Like I'm literally like, you know, yeah. I need like Stuart Smalley in my head. Yeah. You're good enough. You're people, <laughs> like you. people like you, David. <laughs> yeah, darn it. People like you. Right. <laughs> but that's not the story that we always tell ourselves. Correct. And, you know, that's where affirmations and meditation and yeah. again, surrounding yourself with the right people, um, you know, really help you. And yes. I go to a lot of events like you and I'm always stunned when people either recognize me or they're like, I watch your videos and, and I want to talk to you. And I'm like, Inside the the voice in my head is like, why? There's nothing. Or I want to come to your office. I'm like, it's just an office. There's no magic here. We're just doing the thing. <laughs> so isn't it funny? And some of that is taking action, the ability to get through that. Because the yeah. second time you got a mortgage, not so scary anymore, right? Yeah. Just right. taking that first step, taking the second step doesn't make the first step look so scary. Hundred percent. You just you know, 
I mean, I, I'm a big list person because because I just forget. So I'm all, all, always keeping lists. And, you know, I, I, even in my office, I surround myself with people who help me get those tasks over the line. Yeah. And you just have to try. Yeah. Right. I, there are a lot of people who are dumber than both of us who are incredibly rich because they just don't have fear. They just know to go do the thing. Yeah. Outside of real estate, what are you most passionate about? And I mean, my family, right? I, I just have a new grandson. Congrats. You know, the challenge for me is that I'm not an incredibly balanced person. I'm pretty much all real estate all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And again, thank God my wife is, is on board for all of that dopiness and, you know, allowing me to go out and travel and build the business and do those things. But what I've learned is I'm never going to be a 50-50 person. I don't know most entrepreneurs are, right? We don't have balance. But what we do is... We do set aside those times to spend with the family and be there and be focused and really have, you know, peak life experiences. That's just a great term that I heard years ago. So, you know, I do make sure that, you know, we go on vacations and, you know, I go out and, you know, we do things. I, I do my very best to be disconnected from this and engaged in, you know, in, you know, the family life and, you know, seeing my grandson and spending time with my wife and, you know, tonight it's my son's 30th birthday. So we're going out to dinner and, right. you know, I will turn my phone off and we will be there and present for three or four hours and, and spend time together. What's your favorite way to make an impact in the community? I love, I, so it, it, this is my favorite thing, but it's also the most difficult thing to do hmm. is I do enjoy spending time with new investors. I love seeing young kids investing. Like, I, there's a, a local uh, college group here, you, you, the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. They have a real estate club, and I've spent a bunch of time with them. We've hired some of their some of their students, yeah. I, because I started really, really started um, at 40. Right by the time I really started accumulating properties, yeah. and my biggest regret in life is that one I didn't start earlier. Two yeah. that I didn't buy more properties during the last big recession. So I do love spending time with newer and younger investors because. I'm an incredibly introverted person, incredibly. And I remember what it was like going to my first VM meeting and being afraid to talk to anybody. And, you know, even over the first couple of years, knowing who the, the big investors were, were in Orlando and never having the courage to go over to that side of the room and talk yeah. to them. Yeah. Right. And somehow I've become that person, which is, again, the craziest thing. But, um, but I do like spending time with them. However, you know, time is an issue, right? When you run a bunch of different companies. Correct. So what we do is we have a meetup here in Chattanooga and I invite them all to my office. We do it like the third Tuesday of every month. I buy pizza, I buy beer and we'll get 50, 60 people in the room here and I'll bring on a speaker and then we'll hang out for a couple hours. And so that's the time that I've got to really give back to those people. And, I, you know, I try to get on podcasts and do as much of that. Yeah, here. no, that's cool. Say this year or actually last year, we launched uh, Real Grit Vault, a collection of resources available mm -hmm. to our listeners. And I understand you've got a contribution to the vault here for, for everyone who's listening. Yeah, yeah. So again, you know, really my superpower is, is marketing and um, really making complex things simple. We have two sayings in our office that are like everybody knows. One simple is scalable, right? Um, you and I are both very smart guys. We can do a lot of complicated, crazy real estate things, but I can't bring somebody in off the street and teach them, Correct. you know, all these weird things, right? We, we have to, to be scalable. We have to do one thing and do it, do it well. That's why Domino's, McDonald's, Subway, right? They have scaled out because they keep it very simple. Mm -hmm. I tell people, if you want to understand that, go watch the movie, The Founder with Michael Keaton, where they talk about laying it out and taking out all the extraneous steps. So simple is scalable. And if you do the thing, the thing works. Like if you follow the plan, the plan will work. Um, but anyways, for the vault, um, we, uh, again, we're, you know, one of the things that I'm known for, and I do a lot of coaching and consulting on is the disposition side of the business. So we have a, um, a video and a spreadsheet where we have really dialed it down to, you know, the top 10 ways to sell just about any deal. And, if you do these these 10 things and follow the steps, you will sell probably 80% of your deals, right? Now, of course, there's always going to be the weird outliers, but um, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to contribute that. And, and hopefully that, that'll that help some people move their deals. And especially in today, you know, the, the environment we're in right now where it's been more challenging, um, you know, people just don't have a system on how to do that side of the business. And that's really lacking. I think it's a great contribution. You guys can pick that up, www.realgritvault.com.
com and you can get it there. David, for people um, who want to connect with you, they want to find you, they want to follow you, where can yeah. they go? What should they do? Come find me on Instagram. That's I'm um, pretty maxed out on Facebook, um, but it's at David Olds, R-E-I. So D-A-V-I-D-O-L-D-S-R-E-I. And we drop a ton of content, uh, three or four videos a day, reels there, where it's you know just random real estate stuff, stuff that's going on in our office, could be clips from, you know, from this podcast, but we're, we're just, just tons of content and good information. And uh, yeah, hopefully that will help people, but I answer my own Instagram. So if you've got a question, you know, shoot me a message. I'll, I'll do my very best to, if I can't answer it, I'll, I'll connect you with the right person. That's terrific. We appreciate that. The link will be in the show notes below for everybody. David, I appreciate your time to connect up here. You've got a wonderful story about uh, going through the craziness that, uh, well, that was, that was the financial crisis and, you know, the, the hub of it in, in Florida and how you've, um, burned a new path and you just don't quit. So I, it's a wonderful story. It's inspirational. So thanks so much for the time. You bet. Hey, I'm Neil Timmons from here at Real Grit, reminding you that real estate requires real grit. See you next time. What if I told you you can make 20 times the return of a single family fix and flip on your next big deal? Well, it's actually possible. It's possible inside the world of commercial real estate. Say, I'm inviting you to this free challenge. It starts August 15th. It's totally free. It's a five-day challenge where I'm going to take you and deep dive into the world of commercial real estate, more specifically, capital multiplier properties, what that is, how we identify them. I'm going to show you how to identify them, how to evaluate them, and how to lock them up. Risk-free. I'm going to give you all the paperwork to do it. It's totally free. You can sign up to join us at www.20xprofitchallenge.com forward slash real grit. That's www.20xprofitchallenge.com forward slash real grit. And I'll see you in the challenge. If you like our content and want more, you can access it at realgritpodcast.com. You hear it guest after guest. Instinctively, you already know it. But let me call it out. The most expensive action is inaction. The real estate market is full of opportunities. You just need to uncover them. You can build a business that lasts for years, makes monumental impact in the lives of those that you love. It's not just about business, but about the freedom you get because of it. Have you ever heard the saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I believe that partnering is essential. In fact, I partner with hardworking investors all the time. The point is that you can get a lot further with the right partner. Let me say it again, the right partner. If you've ever thought about partnering with anyone, or if you have a partner now, I encourage you to download my free Partner and Profit Guide, which includes the top five must-answer questions to evaluate a profitable partnership. You can find it at www.legacyimpactpartners.com. I'll see you in the next episode.